But let's fast forward to today. We do our research on the web, plan get-togethers using mobile location services, keep in touch with friends on social networking sites, and start global businesses online. When we make international phone calls, many of us do so for a fraction of what it once cost, thanks to the internet. Of course, the internet has been used for even more dramatic purposes, by doctors to improve a medical outcome, by consumers to express opinions, by a nation's citizens to rally support for a point of view or to protest political repression. One obvious recent example is the Arab Spring. Indeed, there is emerging consensus that the ability to use the internet to express views and communicate should be a fundamental human right. Five years ago, when the internet had roughly half the number of users it has now, the idea that the use of the internet was somehow a fundamental right would likely have been a fringe view. Today, I think most of us would say that people in every nation must be able to use the internet to inform and make their voices heard. Sadly, we still have a way to go to make this a reality. As a contributor to the world economy, the internet's impact is staggering. The Boston Consulting Group says the internet contributed $2.3 trillion to the world's biggest economies in 2010, an amount higher than the GDP of the United Kingdom. And if the internet were its own sovereign nation, it would now trail only the United States, China, Japan, Germany, and France in terms of economic clout. In addition, the internet is a much needed source of job creation. A report by the consulting firm McKinsey found that in France, in the last 15 years, the internet has created 1.2 million jobs versus the 500,000 it lost through disintermediation. That's 2.4 new jobs created for every job lost. And worldwide, again quoting directly from the study, the brunt of its economic contribution derives from established in industries that, in the shadow of the internet, have become more productive, have created more jobs, have increased standards of living, and have contributed more to real growth. Moreover, 75% of the value add created by the internet is in <clears throat> traditional industries. It's no surprise that we believe the internet is a good thing at the Internet Society, and that's why so many people across the world are concerned when we run into obstacles with the potential to impede progress. For example, the proposed U.S. legislation to protect copyright holders, known as the Stop Online Piracy Act and the Protect Intellectual Property Act, known as SOPA and PIPA, they both might have made sense from a purely theoretical perspective, but they would have had a negative impact on Internet users' experience. And that's also true of ACTA, the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement, which was similar in intent and international in scope. And the challenges keep coming. Most immediately this year, there are a number of international proposals that threaten to jeopardize some of the core principles of the Internet. These proposals could result in countries assessing higher fees for data traffic, resulting in higher costs for everyone, and raising the likelihood that some people would not use these services because they're more expensive. Clearly, this approach would not advance economic development and would harm those who can least afford it. The language of some of the other proposals would compromise privacy or impact citizens' rights or allow nations to restrict the free flow of content that passes over their networks. If this happens, the internet will become a series of checkpoints and would become balkanized. 